Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, we have a real good group here today, and everybody's enjoyed one another, and that's great. It's good to have you on the first day of the week. Uh, I'd like to invite our visitors to come back and be with us, and we appreciate the fact that you came our way. Uh, if you have any questions about what we, what we say and we do here, just uh, talk to one of the elders or one of the men of the congregations, and we'll, we'll try to get you a Bible answer. Right? And we would certainly appreciate you coming our way. We meet uh, on Sunday mornings at uh, 9 o'clock and, and for Bible study and 10 o'clock for worship service. And we meet again tonight at uh, 5 o'clock, and that'll be our singing night. And uh, for the song leaders, uh, Ron will be leading the, the song leaders tonight. So uh, if you'd like to lead a song, please get with him and give him the numbers uh, today so we can have those added so we won't have a bunch of confusion tonight, okay? <laughs> Let us continue to remember those uh, that are on our sick list that, uh, that are shut-ins. It's good to see Dorothy here with us today. Uh, the Franklins are, are shut-ins. Uh, Bill Orr, uh, 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 Brother Stewart, Dick Stewart, certainly the, they would love to be here, but uh, we miss them, and we need to continue to pray, pray for them and for their recovery. Uh, on a sad note, uh, Glenn Seaton, mother who lived in Memphis and has been there for a while in a, in a, in a home, and uh, she's struggled, and she passed away, and she will be, uh, they'll be taking her to Louisville to be buried there. So let us remember Glenn and his family and Doug uh, with the loss of their mother. Steve's dad, on a good note, Steve's dad is, is home, and he is doing some better. Uh, well, that's great. Uh, Tammy has a new nephew. His name is Colt Dixon. That's Casey's uh, new son. So congratulations to, to Tammy and Casey. Those that are out of town today, uh, the Hubers will be going out of town. And uh, I'm a little bit envious about where they're going. They're going to Hawaii for several days. And we certainly hope that they have a, a good, good trip and a safe trip. Uh, I've been reading too much about the airline flights, and 39%, Mark, you know, <laughs> are having trouble getting anywhere. So, uh, And Judy and I are also going out of town this week. We're going to, uh, to uh, Colorado for uh, one of my Carpet One meetings, and uh, please remember us in your prayers also. The, I believe the, the, the Fords are out of town today, so let us remember them in our prayers. Any, any others that I've overlooked that are out of town that uh, I need to announce? Uh, those to serve today, uh, Evan is on the AV today. Uh, Cannon will, uh, not Cannon, Cannon's out of town, so Cody will be taking his place. He'll be reading Psalm 78, 26 through 31. Uh, Mark uh, Huber is the song leader. The opening prayer is Greg Redman, and the closing prayer is Pat Windhorse. Tim Smith will preside at the uh, table, Lord's Table, and uh, Spencer has the prayer for the bread, and Drew has the prayer for the fruit of the vine, and Carlos will bring us the lesson. And I complimented uh, Carlos on his lesson today. I thought 
he covered that lesson about as thoroughly as anybody I've ever seen. And if you ever got any more questions about that, if you didn't find the answers there, I don't know if you're going to find the answers, but also he covered it well. Thank you, Carlos. We appreciate that. Any other announcements we need to make before we uh, begin? Cody? This morning I'll be reading from Psalm 78, verses 26 through 31. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he directed the south wind. When he rained meat upon them like the dust, even winged fowl like the sand of the seas, then he let them fall in the midst of their camp, round about their dwellings. So they ate and were well filled, and their desire he gave to them. Before they had satisfied their desire, while their food was in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them and killed some of their stoutest ones and subdued the choice men of Israel. We'll have two songs and then we'll have our opening prayer. We'll sing one more song and then have the Lord's Supper. Is it for me? Oh, is it for me, dear Savior, thy glory and thy rest? For me so we can sing.
Let us pray. God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for loving us. And we thank you, Jesus, for loving us. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Father, forgive us when we fall short. Help us to forgive others that sin against us. God, please hear our prayer. We pray for all those less fortunate than us. We pray that we can go out into the world, shine as your examples for all to see. Father, we pray for all those that are traveling, that they'll have safe travels. We pray for those mentioned that are having physical and medical conditions that need to be tended to, and we pray that they'll get the attention they need. We pray for our shut-ins. Let them know that they're not forgotten. We thank you, Father, for our lives and our families and our homes and everything you blessed us with. That we're always mindful that everything we have comes from you. Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers and we thank you for answering our prayers. It's in the name of your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When my love to Christ grows weak. We ask ourselves often, and one of the biggest questions is, why did Jesus come to earth? And we sing songs about it, and, and um, he tells us why he came to earth. And in John chapter 6, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. That is the will of the Father who is in heaven. We uh, just think about God had a plan. Jesus was knew when he came to earth that he was part of the plan, but this wasn't something he looked forward to because Jesus was 100% God, but as Carlos says, he was also 100% man. And we can't, I don't understand that, but 
what man wants to be crucified on the cross? Who wants to go through the pain? Why did Jesus do that? It's because he loved us. He came to fulfill the, the, the word and he knew that this had to be done. We read in the chapter, chapter nine of, uh, says I have, I'm sorry. When Jesus came to earth, he was like a man. He felt pain. You know, we think about Jesus. He, he, st he stumped his toes. He felt pain like we did. He felt emotional pain. He felt things that, that, that we can't even imagine because Jesus knew he was going to go to the cross. In chapter 19, it says, And Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Well, that was... We run past that many times, and what does that mean? He was literally beaten, and this was before he even went to the cross. They mocked him emotionally, psychologically, by calling him, making fun of him, calling him the hell, the king of, chief, the, king of the Jews, and they struck him with his hands. They spit on him. Pilate was trying to reason with him, and, but Jesus wouldn't answer him. Jesus knew what he was gonna go through. And Jesus, Pilate said to Jesus, don't you understand that if you talk to me, I can, I can stop this? And in verse 10 there, Jesus says, you have no power at all against me unless it come from you from up above. Jesus had all power, not just on earth, but in heaven too. When Jesus was finally put to death, we read in verse 17 of chapter 19 of John, he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the Place of the Skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him on either side, and Jesus was in the center. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. Again, this was to be mocking. Here's Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The chief priest of the Jews said, do not write the king of the Jews, write, he said I am the king of the Jews. Pilate didn't do that, but on down in verse 28, when Jesus finally died, he brought, said it is finished. Well, really it wasn't what was finished. Well, the, what was finished was the will of, G of God that he die on the cross and now the, the new plan goes into effect. And the emblems we're about to take up now is, is instituted by Jesus himself. This isn't something we just come up with on our own. Jesus thought that this day was so, so um, memorable that we should take, partake of this. This is something that we actually physically do every, every first day of the week. And we can read about the, the uh, institution by Jesus in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. And um, let's just, as we partake of these emblems, just, just remember how much Jesus loved us, that he went through all that just to fulfill the plan that we may have a home in heaven. Spencer, would you lead us for the cup? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for this opportunity to remember that great sacrifice that was given in our stead. Father, we thank you for the bread that represents your son's body that was broken on that cross for us. Father, as we partake, we ask you will be with each one of us and help us to understand the importance of this great sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, from the crown of thorns that was put on our Savior's head, the blood flowed freely from his head and his face. To the nails that were driven in his hands, the blood flowed freely from his hands and his feet. From the scourging from his back, from the severe beatings, the blood flowed down his back and the back of his legs. And Heavenly Father, from the spear that was thrusted in his side, the blood flowed freely. We ask here now, our Heavenly Father, to put thy blessings upon this cup that represents the blood that was shed upon the cross, so we may have the forgiveness of sin and, and eternal life with thee. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able at this time, let's stand as we sing This Is My Father's World before the lesson.
Good morning, brethren. It's great to see you on this beautiful day that the Lord has blessed us with. It's great to have another opportunity to worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking all the men who have come up before me, leading our minds and our hearts and singing songs of praise to our God and preparing our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper and in leading us in prayer uh, before God. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew. The chapter is 6 and the verse is 33. That is going to be our scriptural text along with Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. We're going to be looking at both of those verses, beginning with Matthew 6 at verse 33, where the Bible reads, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, the Bible reads, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. A former inmate said he was supposed to go to prison for a very long time, but he was released early, thanks to 33 years of perfect attendance. Now this inmate, he did not have the choice nor did he have the ability to change his attendance record one way or another, but we do. And this morning, with these things in mind, uh, we are going to be studying the subject, drawing attention to our attendance. Drawing attention to our attendance. And there are a number of questions that I want us to ask ourselves on this morning in regards to this subject. Uh, the first question that I want us to ask ourselves is this. Are we failing to assemble by choice? Are we failing to assemble by choice? You see, the issue is not missing. The issue is forsaking. And I love the way the New King James translates Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where it says forsaking. Now, I'm sure that all of us at one point or another have been in a position where we have missed worship service or Bible class. Maybe we were sick. Maybe we had a medical emergency. Maybe we had a work emergency. Maybe we had a weather issue. Now, I want to say something on weather issues before I continue. I didn't realize weather issues could keep someone from worshiping God until we moved out this way. In Arizona, I mean, unless you lived in a place that flooded and you literally couldn't get around the flood, we, we really never had weather, weather uh, excuse me, services canceled due to weather. But living out here, I mean, just this past winter, what happened? I mean, I couldn't even get out of my driveway. You know, the tires were slipping around. So maybe that's us. Maybe we had weather issues. Maybe we had bridge issues. I know all of our brethren who live in Illinois are familiar with that one. All the issues that happen and, and all the things that are going along uh, with the bridge. Maybe, maybe we just had some physical circumstance that kept us from worshiping. Maybe we were traveling. You know, I have a brother who, uh, he, he, I was talking to him and, and he was telling me about the time where, you know, he had to preach a, a, a sermon, but he couldn't leave until the morning of th that, that Sunday morning. So he got the earliest flight he could. He was at the airport at four o'clock, left at six o'clock, or was supposed to leave at six o'clock to arrive, you know, somewhere between seven, seven thirty. And he was delayed in the airport all day. He missed his, his, his scheduled gospel meeting because he was stuck in the airport. Now, there could be a number of reasons we miss worship. There could be a number of reasons we miss Bible study. But I want us to ask ourselves this question. Was our reason for missing valid? Are we missing because something came up? Or are we missing because we simply did not feel the need, nor did we have the desire to be there? Is there anything that qualifies us Christians to not be regular in our attendance to worship God and to grow in our knowledge of him collectively? Again, the issue is not missing. The issue is when we make the conscious choice to not be at worship or Bible study. The issue is when we do not make an effort to be where God expects us to be. We must do everything in our power to be at worship. We must do everything in our power to be at Bible study. We must know and remember that God, unlike man, has the ability to know our heart, 
So God knows when we are putting forth the effort to be where he expects us to be or not. Now, when we choose not to be at worship, when we choose not to be at Bible study, we are revealing to God that our priorities are out of order. We proclaim through our actions or lack thereof the importance God and his commandments have on our lives. Not only are we commanded to come together, as we read in our scriptural text, Hebrews 10.25, but I want us to look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and the verses are 1 through 5. 1 Peter, the chapter is 5 and the verses are 1 through 5. Listen to the words of Peter as he says, beginning in verse 1, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those who, in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the, the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfaded crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here we read that the elders are to properly and biblically shepherd the flock. And the flock is to be subject to our our shepherds. So, what could possibly be the purpose of the elders deciding to worship twice on Sunday and have a midweek Bible study? Well, the answer to those questions is to make sure the congregation is fulfilling our command to assemble for worship on the first day of the week and to make sure that the flock is fed with the spiritual nourishment needed to continue the fight against wickedness. You see, it is the responsibility of the elders to see fit that the congregation of the Lord is moving in the right direction, which is a direction closer to Christ instead of further away from him and back into the world. Again, When we look at the scriptures, we see in several places that the Bible records that the congregation is to be submissive to righteous elders leading the congregation in the right direction, which is God's direction. Now, does a Sunday morning worship, does a Sunday evening worship, and does a midweek Bible study assist the congregation in moving closer to God? The obvious answer to that question is yes, and we should not choose to be elsewhere. Now, do situations come up? Yes. Can we have a valid reason for missing? Absolutely. But the point that I want us to make, and the point that that I'm trying to make, is not to reveal the role of the elders as much as it is to reveal the heart of the Christian. If there is not external circumstances and we are just choosing not to be here, then brethren, we have a heart condition that needs to be addressed. We cannot be complacent in our Christianity. To be complacent is to allow our self-satisfaction to reach a point where we become unaware of the dangers and deficiencies that come with that state of mind. Are we satisfied with a Sunday morning is good enough attitude towards worship? Do we feel that we will not benefit from a Sunday evening worship? Do we feel that we will not benefit from a Sunday morning Bible class? Do we feel that we will not benefit from a midweek Bible class? Brethren, if we are satisfied with the idea that a once a week attitude or once a week presence is good enough, then I hate to inform you that we are setting ourselves up for failure. There is great importance in assembling together. We are fulfilling commands from God when we assemble together. We receive needed encouragement, bonding, and growth that comes as a result of not only our presence, but our attention when we are present. When we fail to assemble by choice, we are sinning, and we are not pleasing our God. So are we failing to assemble by choice? I want us to ask ourselves that question. The next question that I want us to ask ourselves is this. To what are we committed? To what are we committed? I think it's safe to say that we are all committed to our priorities. Now, work should certainly be a priority. 
Because the scriptures teach in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and the verses 10, if anyone is not willing to work, neither shall he eat. But is our commitment to work more of a priority than our commitment to God? Now, let, let me be perfectly clear that I am not under the false impression that everyone's circumstance and everyone's situation is the same. And that will, what will work for one person is guaranteed to work for another. But I am understanding of the fact that everyone's situation is different, and I am not advising one should just up and quit their jobs. Brethren, please understand that my goal is to simply call attention to our hearts and where we place our priorities. And when we think about it, in the end, we are to always trust in the Lord to provide for us anyway. We are not to trust in ourselves. We are not to trust in our jobs. We are to trust in the Lord. So God should never be second to anything in our lives. Now, I don't know the effort that you have put forth to be here every chance you get. Only you do. I do not know your work situation and whether or not you have tried to make arrangements to be here when the doors are open. Only you do. But I do know that using your entire lunch break to make worship service shows one's commitment to God. I do know that being here every time the doors are open and rarely missing, except for the fact that maybe you have to perform a surgery or your job takes you out of town, that shows one's commitment to God. I know that being in pain due to age, but having the attitude that I can hurt in the pew just as well as I can hurt in my comfortable chair at home shows one's commitment to God. I know being a good athlete with a championship game on a Wednesday night, but choosing to be at Bible study instead because one knows that that is where they need to be shows one's commitment to God. God is pleased when our priority is him and, he, and our lifestyle displays that commitment to that priority. Being here every chance we get shows one's commitment to God. Now, going back to that last question, are we missing by choice? The issue is not with missing. The issue is with forsaking, having the attitude that we do not need to be there. Is that our attitude? And if that is, brethren, we, we really need to correct that. You see, the scriptures teach that we are to seek God first. Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. When we choose to put God anywhere but first, we fail to keep this command. When we prioritize everything else in our lives, or we show ourselves to be responsible to everything else but the Lord, we fail to keep this command. There are times in life where we are going to have to compromise, or we may have to compromise. But what are we willing to cut out of our lives in order to stretch our time? Brethren, our attendance is one of the easiest ways we can show our commitment to God. What is easier than just showing up? Now, I'm not saying that that's all we have to do. I'm not saying that God is okay if we just show up because the scriptures teach that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. To worship God in spirit is with the right attitude. So even if we're showing up and we're doing everything the way God wants us to do it, but we don't have the right attitude towards doing it, that's not pleasing to God. And when we have the attitude that, oh, well, I'm supposed to be here and I'm just going to show up because I'm supposed to be here, that's not pleasing to God. You know, going back to the, the idea that, you know, the elders have seen fit for us to worship Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday. If the elders saw fit because of the circumstances or because of the situation, that it would be beneficial to the congregation to come together every day of the week. We should put forth the effort to be here. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. How difficult is that to be? Now, again, I understand circumstances come up. I understand that not everyone's situation is, is the same. I understand that work situations and life situations and things come up. But how much effort are we putting forth? 
If we put forth the effort, God will take care of the rest. Now, are we truly, truly putting forth the effort, effort to keep God first? Our level of commitment should never be affected by comfort. Are we committed to God so long as we remain comfortable? I want us to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. 1 Thessalonians, the chapter is 1. And the verses are 6 and 7. Though the Bible reads, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word with much affliction, with the joy, uh, excuse me, you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So as you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Here we see that the Thessalonian brethren surely were not comfortable suffering afflictions for following Christ. And yet they remained so committed that they became examples to other Christians. Brethren, our commitment should not be based on our level of comfort. And we must challenge each other to increase in godliness despite our discomforts. You see, Satan, as we have discussed time and time again, is going to do everything in his power to make us uncomfortable. He's going to do everything in his power to make us feel that where we're at is good enough. He's going to do everything in his power to make us feel that the mindset that we have, that, oh, well, I'll go when I can go. I'll show up when I can show up. I'll show up when I want to show up. Is good, but we must understand that what is good in our minds, and when we trust our hearts, we can be led astray. So we should not do that. So to what are we committed? Are we a failing to assemble by choice? And the last question, well, one of the last questions that I want us to focus on is, do we have conviction? Do we have conviction? Convic conviction is a strong belief that affects how we live. If we choose to be completely committed to Christ, then our lives will display our conviction to that strong belief that a life committed to Christ is necessary. If we are convinced that God must be a priority, then we will be committed to him. And in all of our choices, God will be glorified. And our conviction will come to light by the way we conduct ourselves. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but there is a thing in the NCAA called the BYU rule. Now, BYU is, uh, stands for Brigham Young University, and it is a Mormon uh, university in Utah. And uh, basically what the BYU rule is, is if BYU, which is again owned and operated by the Mormon church, if they make the NCAA tournament, and if they make it to the Sweet 16, the NCAA will make changes to the brackets and they will make changes to the dates because BYU refuses to compete on Sundays because of religious beliefs. I mean, think about that. How much conviction these people have that they said, hey, well, we'll just forfeit the tournament. If we make it to the Sweet 16, which, I mean, sounds crazy. I didn't believe it, but I looked it up and that's the case. If they make it to the Sweet 16, they will forfeit the tournament if they have to play on a Sunday. So the, the NCAA will make arrangements. So, brethren, if, this, if these people are, 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 have that much conviction to a false teaching, where should our level of conviction to the Lord and the truth be? You see, conviction always wins. Hypocrisy will fail. Inconsistency will fail. Our conviction cannot be conditional. There's a 16-year-old girl, member of the church, uh, faithful member of the church. Uh, you know, she turned 16, so she wanted, to, she wanted to start working. So she went to a grocery store and said, you know, I'm going I'm to start working at this grocery store. And they said, okay, you know, what's your schedule look like? And she said, well, I can't work Sundays and I can't work Wednesday evenings. And uh, they said, well, you know, we might need you to work uh, some of those days. And she said, well, I can't do it. 
So her attitude was, I mean, if I can't have this schedule, then I'll find a job, I'll find a job elsewhere. So they said, okay, we'll give you the job. They scheduled her on a Sunday morning. She said, I can't show up. She said, well, we need you to come in. She said, well, I'll come in at one, but I have to be off by four. So they scheduled her that they were, they were okay with that. And they never scheduled her another Sunday again because she had conviction. Now at this same grocery store was a sister in Christ who had been working there for 10 years and saw that this 16 year old girl who had been there maybe 10 days was able to get Sundays off. And she said, Oh, well, I I can't work Sundays. And they basically said to her, you've proven for the last 10 years that you can work Sundays. Conviction goes a long way. Conviction will always win. And brethren, we cannot expect people to take us seriously if we aren't serious. We cannot expect people to take our faith seriously if we do not take our faith seriously. When we are standing before God on the day of judgment, the scriptures reveal to us that we will have to give an account for all that we have done, both good and evil, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and the verses 10. This is the question that I want us to ask ourselves. This is the question that I want us, I want us to leave here considering. Can we say with full confidence that God will accept our reason for missing opportunities to assemble? I'll say that again. Can we say with full confidence that God will accept our reason for missing opportunities to assemble? If the answer is a confident yes, God will accept our reason for missing opportunities to assemble, then okay. But if our answer is anything but yes, if our answer is no, if our answer is I'm not sure, if our answer is I think so, brethren, Maybe God is drawing our attention to our attendance so that we can be paying more attention to our attendance. So where do you stand on this morning? You know, sometimes when a preacher gets up and starts talking about things like attendance, kind of rubs people the wrong way. Sometimes people don't like hearing what they need to hear. But you know, There is a benefit to hearing what we need to hear. Jesus didn't tell people what they wanted to hear. Jesus told people what they needed to hear. Jesus didn't tell people things that would be tickling their ears that would make them feel good. Jesus told them things that they needed to do to get right with God. Brethren, we not only have to get right with God, we have to maintain a right relationship with God. What is more of a priority than being here? Again, are there, are there circumstances that can come up? Yes, there are. I'm not going to sit here and say that if you miss, if you just miss, that's a problem. Because when we read Hebrews 10.25, the issue is not with missing. The issue is with forsaking, willfully choosing not to be where God expects us to be. That's the problem. If something comes up weather-wise, then let it be. If something comes up work-wise, an emergency, then let it be. But how much of an effort are we putting forth? You know, I remember when we first lived in West Frankfurt and we we first dealt with this whole weather issue. I remember getting in the truck, never having really experienced snow. I mean, the most snow I'd seen in 28 years in Tucson was maybe five times and, and only one time it really stuck to the point where you could see it later that day. But the next day it was gone. So that's the little amount of snow that I had, I had ever experienced. So. You know, I had gone to the church building. I didn't live that far from it. I walked down the church building. I was like, oh, this is fine. Slipped probably two or three times on the way there. Got in the truck, started, you know, trying to drive around. Couldn't do it. I said, okay. Well, now I understand that it's not just, you know, people wanting to cancel worship. It's the weather is literally forbidding this from happening. And sometimes that happens. But where is our heart? That is what we need to draw attention to. Where is our heart? Are we here because we want to be here? Are we here because we feel obligated to be here? Or are we not here because we don't care? If that's the issue, brethren, then that needs to be addressed.
because God is not pleased with such an attitude. So if you are here this morning and you are not a Christian, our prayer is that the Lord gives you the time needed to reflect on where you are headed. And if you have realized that that is towards an eternity separated from God, that outcome can be altered this day by obeying the gospel, which begins with hearing God's word, which you have done on this morning, believing Jesus to be the son of God, confessing Christ, repenting, turning away from sins, turning to God, being baptized for the forgiveness of sins and rising up to walk in newness of life. That is what the scriptures teach that every single person must do in order to have a right relationship with God. That is not my personal belief. That is not the congregation's personal belief. That is what the scriptures teach. One must do to become a Christian. And if you have yet to do so, you can be a Christian today. You can have your sins washed away. You can be forgiven. You can go from sinner to saint. You can go from lost to saved by obeying the gospel. God has seen fit that everyone can do these things here. Anyone who wants to be a child of God can become a child of God. That is a blessing. But maybe you're here this morning and you are a child of God. And you have really not placed emphasis on attendance. You really don't care to be where God wants you to be. Brethren, you know, sometimes we can develop mindsets. And we can convince ourselves that what we think is right when it's wrong. I've told you this example before when I first became a Christian. I would miss Sunday morning worship during football season because, I mean, come on, God knows. God understands. God understands that I need to go watch my team lose and that that's more of a priority than being at worship. Yeah, that lasted about three weeks, not because I'm this righteous man, but because I was like, I felt that conviction. I felt what the scriptures were teaching me. I felt what the scriptures were were showing me that I needed to be. I I wouldn't want God to come and me sitting, you know, in a restaurant watching a football game instead of being at, at worship. Where are our priorities? And if we have not prioritized worshiping God, and put the emphasis on it that we all should, then we can make that correction. Where there's life, there's hope. Where we have life, we have an opportunity to make things right with God, to be pleasing to God, to strive to be better for God. You see, we cannot be satisfied with where we're at. We must always want to grow closer to our Lord. And if that is you, and you need to repent of of having that attitude, you 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 can go to God. That's the beautiful thing about being His child, is you can pray to Him and ask Him for forgiveness. You can have that change of mind that leads to a change of life. And you can ask for prayers on your behalf from your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe you're here and you're visiting with us. Again, we welcome you. But maybe you're looking for somewhere to call home. Maybe you're looking for a congregation to join yourself to that does all that the Lord authorizes. Well, this is our authority. The scriptures tell us what we can and cannot do. And this is our guide. And if you are looking for a place that follows the Bible and nothing more, nothing less, then you have found that place. So whether you need to become a Christian, whether you need to make things right with God, or whether you would like to place membership with this congregation, we ask you to make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.
Thank you, Carlos, for those thoughts. Appreciate that very much. Uh, appreciate the boldness for which you presented that topic. Very good. The like to. Endorse that lesson. We've been talking about this subject, and we're right. aware of some situations that need to be addressed. And we appreciate Carlos approaching this. Amen. Absolutely. We are uh, meeting again tonight at 5 o'clock. I'd like to welcome each and every one of us. Thank you for your prayers of those who are going to be traveling, myself included. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to welcome our visitors who are with us and invite you back at the next opportunity you have to join us. If there's nothing further, we'll be uh, dismissed in prayer. Pat. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to be here this morning to hear your word proclaimed to us. We pray, dear God, that you be with us as we depart from this place, that you keep us safe, that we turn to you for guidance, that we will be the lights you expect us to be in our communities. We thank you, dear God, for the many blessings that you've given us and the prayers that you've answered, and we ask you to again answer the prayers that we put forth to you today. Forgive us of our sins, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen.